A project to reform Islam has certainly become a popular pursuit, especially of Western-based think tanks and policy institutes. At its heart, this project looks to bring Islam into what is called modernity, an embrace of liberalism as a universalism and the inevitable abrogation of those aspects of Islam that have an actual impact on law, order and society. Since 9-11, this reform industry has recruited many Muslims to this venture to somehow give authenticity to its many claims. At the same time, this project has gained currency, albeit with a minority of young educated Muslims who cannot make sense of the excesses witnessed in the dysfunctional Muslim world and legitimized in the name of Islam. It has become an easy go-to answer to a complex set of political, social and economic realities. Today, we bring together two scholars, each on either side of the reform debate. Mustafa Akio is probably the most notable Muslim modernist and reformer. He has authored several best-selling books on the subject, most recently, Reopening Muslim Minds, A Return to Reason, Freedom and Toleration. His argument, as we will hear, is certainly well articulated and nuanced. He writes regularly for the New York Times and other publications. And Mustafa is joined in discussion with Professor Ovamir Anjum, who is Imam Khattab Endowed Chair of Islamic Studies at the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies, University of Toledo. Ovamir penned a recent piece on the need for a caliphate and argues against the reform agenda and has written extensively about Ibn Taymiyyah, who was the subject of his research. Can I remind you, if you like what you hear, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and please do remember to comment on our website, thinkingmuslim.com. We really would appreciate your feedback. So let, let me, well, let me begin, Mustafa, by uh, outlining um, my intentions and, and why I think this is a really important discussion. So, I mean, I wanted to initiate this discussion after a series of mini exchanges you and I had on Twitter. I think it was over apostasy laws and, and the need for, for reform. Since then, you've published your new book, Reopening Muslim Minds, A Return to Reason, Freedom and Tolerance. I suppose your book is a continuation of uh, your project, if, if I may call it that, to call for an Islamic reformation, similar in shape at least to the emergence of the Enlightenment of the 17th, 18th and early 19th centuries. Indeed, you liken this call to that of um, the challenge John Locke put forward uh, when he initiated new ideas, which would inevitably uh, develop into what we know today as classical liberalism. Now, I thought the discussion would benefit from uh, Dr. Overmere's perspective. I believe the two of you have engaged, as you mentioned uh, previously. And um, I, if, if I may, again, Overmere, I may be, this may be a bit, a bit too general, but I think you probably represent a more traditional perspective on uh, Islamic Sharia uh, and related matters. And uh, recently, uh, I, it, it's important to note you've initiated a discussion about uh, uh, within the academic community about the need to reimagine the contemporary yet classical caliphate model as a means to progress in the Muslim world. And I think uh, reading the book of Mustafa, there is a lot there about government that, that possibly we can pick on, we can discuss as we go along. Now, Mustafa, your book is a really interesting read, if I may say, and if I may summarize it, you call for a rethinking of the Sharia, or at least the way Muslims view Islamic law in light of modernity. Your argument is that there is a universalism and it can be sought beyond the legal text. And I think indeed you argue that this universalism, this rational universalism can guide the reading of the sources so that it conforms to modern values of equality and freedom. You call upon uh, precedents in Islamic history from the Mu'tazila to Ibn Rushd, and there's a really fascinating chapter, which again, I would like um, your perspective on, uh, over there on Ibn Rushd and, and um, uh, his thinking and how that uh, was, was you used the word cancelled, how that was cancelled by uh, traditional Muslims during his era, but also after uh, his death. Um, I think it's fair to say that you believe that your message is a return to a core of Islam rather than a departure from it. And again, we, we, we need to talk about that. Um, I think you, you argue that the intervening years, you know, post uh, the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
uh, with caliphs and scholars, uh, there was a, an interpretation of the faith uh, which suited uh, certain power structures. So I suppose your key argument is that somewhere down the line, Muslims lost the ability to reason and to be reasonable. Uh, again, we, we will certainly unpack a lot of this as we go along. Now, before Overmere uh, is able to respond to your book, because I, we sent Overmere your book, and uh, I know he has some uh, interesting thoughts about it, I would like you to first summarize for our listeners what you think are the main challenges uh, the Muslim Ummah face today. Mohammed, thank you so much. Uh, salam alaikum to you and uh, Overmere, and who might be listening to us today. Uh, and thanks for this conversation. Plus, summarizing some of the themes in my book so actually uh, eloquently. Um, since you started from that angle, let me say this. I'm coming from a perspective that, you know, some Turkish theologians call distinguishing the religious from the historical. Like, I believe that we have a great Islamic civilization and tradition. I myself believe I'm grounded in it. But I also think that the Islamic tradition, we have that include, especially the jurisprudential heritage, brings us eternal unchanging principles of Islam and also the way they were articulated in a certain political historical context and some even uh, some of the elements of that context that became part of Islamic law. Uh, so there are, so I'm um, yes, calling for a quote unquote reform that, that has nothing to do with the Protestant Reformation of Martin Luther. People generally make that wrong analogy. I rather called for re-understanding the Sharia in the modern era, because I think what was understood in the past was maybe the best of its time, but we live in a radically different world. Now, some Muslims, actually the majority of Muslims, including the scholars, Ulema would accept certain elements of this argument. And actually, there's one important issue on which we already, I think, distinguished the religious from the historical, and that is the issue of slavery. Until the modern era, slavery was a part of the Sharia. It was, ex it was you know, accepted that, you know, when there's a war on the uh, Muslims wage war against uh, non-Muslims so that they can pay jizya uh, and I mean, at the, during that war, prisoners of war could, be, unless they accepted to pay jizya in the first place, it, it was a conquest, they'd, they could be enslaved. And, and that was a part of the Islamic legal system. And uh, there was slave markets, I mean, in Istanbul uh, until the 20th century. So it was there. Islamic slavery was generally milder and more compassionate than the most terrible experience of slavery we've seen in America, for example. I mean, people rightly mentioned that, and I think that's important. And I think in most issues, the pre-modern Islamic civilization was more compassionate and pluralistic and quote-unquote liberal compared to the Christendom of its time. I mean, Islam was certainly more pluralistic that Jews and Christians could worship at a time when Jews didn't have that right in, let's say, Spain. So, however, at some point it dawned on to us that Slavery is not, a, is not an integral aspect of Islam. It's just something Islam found in its context and legislated it, maybe with the intention of abolishing it totally in the future, which luckily happened, you know, beginning in the 19th century. But I will remind that, you know, when the Ottomans banned slave trade in the middle of the uh, 19th century, the 1850s, uh, with the edict of Sultan Abdul Majid, there was a rebellion in the Arabian Peninsula in, in Hijaz, uh, in Mecca, uh, by Sharif Abdul Muttalib, and he said the Turks have gone infidels right, in Kafir because they're, they're changing something uh, in the Sharia. And slavery was one issue, not the only issue, but it was certainly an emphasized issue. So we, we realized that Islam was born into a world. And I argue that that world had, a, I mean, it's not I argue that, but I mean, I'm pointing that that world had apostasy laws. I mean, you look at the blasphemy, blasphemy and apostasy laws of the Byzantine and Sassanid empires. Oh, you see that in our jurisprudence as well. You don't find them in the Quran in most cases, but you see them in secondary sources of Islam. Like for example, uh, so I argue that what we have to give up in the modern world is coercion in the name of religion. 
to I say we have to fully accept the Quranic principle of la ikraha fiddin. And actually, my book opens with the uh, fun story of me being arrested by the Malaysian pol- Malaysian religion police in 2017, where I gave a lecture on uh, apostasy or ridda uh, in Islam. Where the, whether the term ridda is best translated as apostasy is another discussion, but. I said that, yes, in, in, in our classical jurisprudence, uh, it was considered that somebody who publicly renounces Islam uh, will be given the death penalty. Uh, only Hanafis, you know, slightly disagreed on the women's situation. Uh, and I said, well, this does, as it has no basis in the Quran. Yes, it has a basis in, uh, in a hadith, in two hadiths, in two significant hadiths. They're both ahad hadiths, hadiths with one narrator. And the authority of Ahad Hadith was a disputed issue in, in, in early Islamic jurisprudence. Uh, so uh, I, I argued that uh, this also had a context. I mean, in, in Islam, in early Islam, in, in the environment of early Islam, the political allegiance and the religious allegiance of a person was basically the same thing. So someone who abandons his belief in Islam was potentially an enemy soldier, and he was certainly uh, seen as a political rebel. But we live in a different world. Things have changed. So I think my arg- so I'm arguing for something that you may call liberalism, uh, which is a loaded term. Uh, so I should say a few things about that. So even before that, I mean, let me just read a paragraph to from my book that what I'm saying here, what I say is, uh, the big remedy we need, call it a great reform or renewal, is really having no compulsion in religion. It is, in other words, giving up course of power in the name of Islam. This means no more religious and moral policing, no threats to apostates and innovators in the sense of heretics, no blasphemy laws, no public floggings or stonings for sinners, and no violence or intimidation in the family. It means accepting that religion is advice, nasiha as uh, Hadith and uh, Sahih al-Buhari puts it. So, and why do we have to have this transformation? I mean, I'm arguing for this transformation. Well, I will tell you that, first of all, the context is different. Secondly, whatever wisdom was there behind these coercive elements in our jurisprudence, like, let's say, uh, Hispa, religious policing, as it's understood. I mean, I actually argue that Muhtasib, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, actually established the office of the Muhtasib against fraud in the market, not to, you know, uh, uh, police religious behavior, but it evolved into that over time. And I show how that happened, actually. I mean, I tried to show. Uh, The thing is, even if that, for example, you would have, if you look at jurisprudence, if you look at Hispa books by Imam al-Ghazali or Ma'averdi, you will see how, what to do with someone who doesn't, uh, who abandons prayer, who doesn't do his regular prayer, how that person should be beaten. And so there is the idea that you should coerce people to be pious, uh, at least in the public square. Uh, and today this is reflected in, you know, Iranian police chasing women to wear hijab or uh, there are uh, ikhtiram uh, laws, like respect laws for Ramadan. So if you publicly drink water in Pakistan or uh, in the Gulf, in countries, uh, Saudi Arabia, in UAE, you'll be in trouble. So the police can uh, question you for that, they punish you for that. So these things are, I mean, some of these are state laws, but they, those state laws are inspired by uh, certain verdicts in the jurisprudence and Islamic groups advocate for these things. So my, I would tell you that maybe in a certain social environment and maybe in a certain culture, that ultimately had the impact of making people pious. I mean, you force them a little bit, but ultimately it works for them and you're saving their ahira. Maybe that was what people could think. But in the modern day and age, we have a different culture. We have a different human psyche. And all these acts of coercion from apostasy laws, blasphemy laws, coercive uh, laws, forcing women to wear hijab. This, I believe, uh, it's not that it doesn't look nice to the liberal world or so on and so forth, uh, but it is having the counter effect of provoking apostasy, provoking enmity towards Islam. I met so many people who call themselves ex-Muslims and when I talk to them, they have different reasons. Of course, some of them have just read Richard Dawkins and became atheists. But many of them will tell you also stories of how they were you know, intimidated in a madrasa or they were 
uh, oppressed by one of the regimes that act in the name of Islam today, and 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 so on and so forth. So I think, uh, as it would be awkward and not in the interest of Islam to insist preserving slavery because it is a part of the Sharia today, and I think we had that transformation, luckily, uh, to a great extent. Some people will still think that it is uh, it should be there, but I think that's a minority. On this issue of individual freedom, I think we need to have this transformation. Now, to be able to make the switch in jurisprudence, you open a million doors, right? You have to discuss whether abrogation uh, of the earlier verses by the later verses, which was a part of the jurisprudential, jurisprudential heritage was really necessary and was right. Uh, you discuss whether how accurate are the Sahih Hadith, uh, I mean, at least the hard Hadiths, how authoritative they are in jurisprudence. Uh, you look into the context of things. And also, you open up another discussion, which is, well, we are making these arguments through using human reason. And also, when we refer to liberalism, we are referring to a modern system that is built on human reason. Like, does human reason have that authority? Uh, besides revelation, does human reason have, is there something in human nature to find through, to find good and bad? So that opens a lot of discussions about husn kub, you know, uh, the issue of good and bad in early Islam. And I'm, uh, I take a lot of critical uh, positions regarding the Asharite theology, the Ashari theology, and uh, its insistence that good and bad are come only from revelation, but not from human reason. And I agree with the Mutezla and later with philosophers of Ibn Rushd. And I should say that even the Maturidis within the broader Sunni framework actually uh, agreed with the Mutezla to some extent on this issue. And Ibn Rushd, for example, speaks about Sunan Gair Maktuba, the unwritten laws of humanity, which can help sometimes, uh, helps you to reinterpret the written laws. That would be the laws of fiqh. So uh, there are lots to discuss here. And I believe these are the discussions we need to have. And the, 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 for, for to be able to have these discussions, we need freedom of speech, right? I mean, we wouldn't be able to have this discussion freely, for example, probably in, in, in Iran or Saudi Arabia, but it's, that, it's, it's good that we are having mediums in which we can discuss these issues. Uh, so that's my argument. I'm not calling for Muslims to be conservative. I'm not calling for Muslims to embrace and accept everything in the modern world out there. I'm not saying Islam should uh, not have sense of halal and haram. I'm just saying whatever conviction, religious conviction we have, we have, we should have all the right to practice it. So I'm very much against, for example, illiberal laws in Europe against uh, hijab or even niqab. Uh, so I, I'm in favor of full religious freedom for Muslims to be practicing and pious and conservative. Uh, and I'm, I find myself often uh, critical of some Western governments on those issues. But then I'm in favor of uh, a woman to what, not wear a hijab in Iran freely and not be chased by the religion police, somebody to become an apostate in Saudi Arabia and not be uh, punished or jailed for that. And of course, some people to speak out against the ruler, by the way, which is, we have a big problem with political authoritarianism as well, which doesn't necessarily come from religion, but it can be justified by arguments with religion, as we see in some of the uh, Salafi groups uh, in the Muslim world today who think that obedience to the ruler is a uh, is an uh, is a religious obligation. So this is the kind of transformation I'm speaking about. It has some parallels that has happened in Christianity with John Locke, later Roger Williams in the U.S. Religious freedom, not because there's a problem with religion, I would say, but there's a problem with coercion and there's a problem with a coercive state which we should keep minimal. So under limited states, we can be Muslims in the way we really believe in without oppressing other people and, and representing the best of our tradition without, uh, without using means that will be only counterproductive in the modern world. So how much do you see this project of yours or this idea of yours, um, a, a, a project to secularize Islam? So to, to separate Islam from uh, from the public square insofar as it uh, has a, as you said, a coercive impact on the public square. How much do you envisage uh, your, or is your perception of Islam to be uh, something which is merely spiritual and merely to do with a relationship between man and woman and their creator? 
Well, uh, I'm not calling for secularizing. I mean, I generally am, I, I'm not very happy with the word secularization or secular. Yes, I think a secular state, as long as it has full religious freedom, is a good model to live under. Uh, a secular state that is not like in France or let alone China, which will really uh, have certain limitations on religious freedom. But I think, let's say, a secular state like the United States, uh, where probably, by the way, Muslims are more free than everywhere, <laughs> anywhere else in the world. I mean, in the United States today, you have all kinds of Muslims from all different persuasions. Uh, they all express themselves and uh, without, you know, uh, anyone being uh, intimidated or threatened or let alone persecuted as apostates or heretics or uh, anyway. So uh, to what extent, I mean, I, I, I'm not, again, I, I'm not going to give you fatwas on this or that issue, but I think what I'm trying, especially in this book, what I'm trying to do is to, first of all, establish the idea that the Islamic tradition is a part of history a, is partly rooted in divine revelation and divine guidance and partly rooted in history. And by history, I would even mean the contextuality of the Quran. I mean, I would refer to Fazlur Rahman and his arguments that, you know, the Quran was a revelation speaking to a historical context and we cannot make the, we don't, we are not supposed to literally implement certain things in the Quran, understanding that it's contextual, things like, for example, corporal punishments. Now, I'm entertaining these ideas, and I think we need to discuss these ideas. There is no one way which will say this is the right path. But the minimum I'm asking for is that Muslims should not throw takfir on each other. Uh, uh, different ideas about the interpretation of Islam should not be seen as, uh, as, as kufr, and unless the person renounces, you know, uh, there's that there's one God and Prophet Muhammad is messenger, unless that person denies the foundation of Islam. Uh, it should not be silenced. So somebody uh, offers a textual reading of the Quran, like Nasr Abu Zaid in Egypt, you know, should be able to have that conversation and others should, if it's wrong, that should be refuted. And I think the greatness of the Islamic civilization was at its height when Muslims were able to have these discussions. Uh, I think there are certain periods in Islam where the state intervened and imposed a certain doctrine, and I think those are really bad moments in our history. One is the much-emphasized mihna, uh, and I totally agree with critics uh, of the Mutazilites in, in that regard, that, I mean, mihna, mihna was a terrible thing. Of course, before the mihna, there was the persecution and execution of the Qadaris, the free will defenders under the Umayyads, and after the mihna came the revenge, which is the Itikad al-Qadri, the Qadri creed, where this time the Mutazila creed was declared as Kufr, uh, and, and those who are Mutazila were declared as people who are, whose uh, uh, blood is licit. Uh, so I think we need a secular state, quote-unquote, in the sense that Islamic belief, Akida practice, will be independent, and Muslims might have a healthy, civilized conversations and disagreements among them, which will help the maturation of our tradition. And in, one, in one of the passages in my book, I say, uh, what we needed was not that the Mutazila should have been the official view and, and the Asharites should be suppressed. No, what we needed was a plurality of ideas. And I think our best times in our tradition is when we had that plurality of ideas. And I think uh, the problem uh, in, in the traditional ultimately setting was when the state intervened through madrasas, through sometimes uh, banning through uh, imposition, uh, declared certain ideas of Islam invalid, and, 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 and that led to the shrinking of ideas. And I think the, the greatness of Islamic civilization was thanks to its pluralism, and, and, and that pluralism included pluralism of Islam and other religions, but pluralism within Islam as well. Great. Thank you, Mustafa. Alvabar, I would like your perspective on uh, the book, but also on what Mustafa has just uh, outlined as his, the reason why Islam needs uh, a reformation. Uh, thank you very much, Jalal, for organizing this and Mustafa for agreeing to do this. We have met a few times before and it's always been a pleasure. Um, 
you know, one of the most beautiful things I find in our conversation, we just deeply disagree, but I'm always impressed with your akhlaq and with your openness to a wide range of ideas um, that always challenge me. Um, so now, I guess let me, and, and I know what you've been saying from your earlier book, um, as well as our uh, earlier conversations, and I also um, uh, listened to your uh, podcast conversation with Shadi Hamid, another um, um, thinker whom I value <clears throat> very highly. As I see your project, Mustafa, is to free the Muslim mind by positing that Muslims, with the exception of certain liberal modernists, uh, including yourself, uh, Father Rahman, and perhaps others, uh, Muslims have shut off their minds. And then you seek to demonstrate that by highlighting certain acute examples of practices um, that seem to contradict modern liberal sensibilities, such as slavery and apostasy. And you suggest that the culprit is the Sunnah and Hadith literature, at least one of the main ones, uh, the dominant traditionist schools, uh, Salafis and Ashari's, and uh, you valorize Mu'tazilism and a bit later in history of Rush. Now, this uh, valorization, as I see it, turns out to be tactical for uh, even uh, those, that is, uh, people like Ibn Rush, to the last man, uh, failed to agree with you in many of your recommendations and interpretation of Islam. So Ibn Rush, for example, would never agree to your assessment of Hadith. You recommend that Muslims should secularize um, their political and life and larger as large aspects of their social relations. And ultimately, now, of course, uh, I'm reading this um, as an analyst and not merely quoting you, um, <clears throat> to turn Islam into a copy of liberal Christianity or some version of orthodox or conservative Judaism, which is secularized, people can privately practice uh, their Islam, their Sharia, like some practice people practice halakha. One goes even at times to draw the conclusion from some of your arguments that the only good Muslim is a non-Muslim. Um, and I will get back to that. But I do not, now what I'm saying here, this last um, conclusion is somewhat provocative intentionally. But I, uh, what I did is that um, I took some things out of context in order to reach that conclusion. And perhaps it sounded offensive to you. So what I just did is call the Islamic discussion, you know, lazim al qawl I didn't take your qawl, but your interpretation, in my interpretation of it, and then I put it in your mouth. Now, what I suggest you're doing throughout is you do that to the Quran and the Sunnah and the entire tradition. So you doing that precise kind of thing to the Quran and the Sunnah. In fact, not only are you doing that, you're actually advocating that. Uh, you're advocating that we should read the Quran and the Sunnah uh, selectively, uh, not to speak of tradition, which I agree with you that we should read selectively and critically. In the end, um, I see three big elephants in the room. First, I guess, elephant, the biggest one is uh, your approach to the Quran and Hadith. The second one in your entire system hangs on one thread, which is your understanding of consent versus coercion, so freedom and opposition of freedom to coercion. And you take them to be fairly self-evident universal concepts that can be understood across time and space that could be applied to early Islam, late Islam, now in all different contexts. Uh, so coercion uh, has a meaning to you and, and that's a universal meaning. Um, so I think philosophically that's, uh, and historically, that is a, if you read the literature on consent, even contemporary literature, let alone anything beyond the modern period, uh, you probably would realize, uh, if, if you haven't, I don't mean to be patronizing, that this is a very complex and very um, debated concept of what does it mean uh, to have consent. And finally, I guess the third elephant, the way that you seem to relate to revelation and reason, um, which I think that goes somehow both 
against the rational conclusion one would, rational method one would uh, stick to if one believed in revelation fully, which I, I'm 100% sure that you do. But then somehow your method seems to be cavalier. So it seems to be uh, against both reason and revelation, meaning that if you really take the revelation to be a such an infinite act of uh, infinite God reaching out and telling us that you do the right thing or there is punishment for you and this is the right thing and life is so enormously, Im infinitely important. Uh, your moral decisions are infinitely important and God's presence is, is incomparably important, yet you sort of, uh, rather than dealing with that heaven and hell, importance of, uh, of responding to God in, in a holistic way, you hang everything by a rather tenuous thread of freedom and coercion uh, and a few verses, then that hold up your entire approach to tradition. So I find basically the example that I gave earlier somewhat provocative that you want Muslims to be non-Muslims. Um, that was simply a way to refer to this third elephant, which is the inconsistency of approach. I guess a couple other thoughts to contextualize what I have just said. But first of all, let me then now move on and say things that I agree with you about. I agree with you that what we call freedom today, um, which appeared, there is no word for freedom in any Islamic uh, language, in fact, as you know, until the modern period. But what you have is uh, a different, whole different language and whole different set of concepts. Um, the duty to obey God is the, uh, the, the, if you will, the, the, the much, something much greater than freedom, but also it is what frees us from obedience to, um, to rulers or to men or to tradition even. Uh, it is uh, obedience to God and ibadah itself. So to, for you, I think that uh, you may think of it differently, but of course, I think of what you are calling freedom, the importance of engaging with text as well as one's understanding. This is something that the ulama extensively upheld and fought for and died for if they had to. Um, so the idea of freedom of one's opinion is not new at all. And it's, it's defended, but just in different terms than, than you would give it. Um, similarly, political uh, freedom. So let's accept your terminology now. And let's say, yes, political freedom, absolutely. I agree that, in fact, I go so far as to say that you undermine the problems in the Muslim world by bringing the question of certain liberal, chosen liberal rights above the question of political legitimacy, accountability, and, uh, and freedom. Um, so for instance, uh, I would in fact go so far as to say that uh, uh, all these um, brutal dictators in the Muslim world for the last uh, 70, 80 years would have been very happy with you. They would in fact say, yes, freedom, great, liberal rights, absolutely, I want them, and democracy, hell with that. Accountability, hell with that. Legitimacy, hell with that, because what I have are modern Western principles of freedom, and I will make these pe people free, even against their will. So I think Atatürk would have been happy with you, Musharraf would have been happy with you, Suharta would be happy with you, Burgiba would have been happy with you. Burgiba, in fact, uh, in Tunisia even said that, you know, uh, people should not um, uh, fast in Ramadan because it may be economically bad and, and so on. And that he wanted to make people free and you can, uh, but, but freedom comes from me. So Muhammad bin Salman, Muhammad bin Zayed today, I think would, would be very happy with you if they understood what you're saying, because they are trying to free their people from uh, religious constraints and from what they see as a problem. Um, secularism, I think that one of the where we disagree most is how you understand secularism. You take secularism to be neutrality, and you somehow seem to think that you can use the language of secularism or choose to call it aggressive or neutral secularism. I'm sure you're familiar with your friend's argument, uh, Ahmed Kuru's book on 
French secularism, aggressive, American secularism, uh, gentle and nice, and we want it. Um, Mustafa Ataturka, oh, he was bad, but, um, but uh, I think that secularism is misunderstood by Kuru in the same way that you misunderstand Islamic tradition, meaning that it is a kind of thing you can pick selectively from it whatever you want. It is kind of like a dial of volume that you can turn up or down depending on where you want it, as if it has no logic of its own, as if it's, it doesn't have any commitments and sort of, uh, you know, uh, rea material realities and psychological social realities that it responds to. The reason French secularism turned aggressive was because it is the modern state elite trying to gain control of a territory and its people. And if religion established there as Catholic Church was in France, uh, well, secularism has to become more aggressive. If you come to America where there is no established, single established church, there are many different ones, then uh, secularism is easier and different um, in, it, in its nature. And it in fact takes different forms. Uh, Ataturk was dealing with a very entrenched uh, religiosity and, and the tradition of Ottoman Empire. So he had to be aggressive. It wasn't a matter of you sit back in a seminar room and choose which kind of secularism we want, as if secularism is not a doctrine that has a logic of its own. Mustafa, I want, I want to pick up on, I mean, I'm sure you, you would like to talk about, uh, you know, the, the various issues that have been raised there. There's an interesting point about secularism uh, that Overman made towards the end there, which I would like you to pick up on. Um, uh, is, is secularism benign? Is secularism without coercion? Uh, sure, I'll speak about that. And uh, thanks to Ovamir for his very detailed uh, disagreement and, you know, critique. There's just a few things that I had to, you know, object. <laughs> One is, uh, I think that was a little bit hyperbole, but you say, you know, the, the only good Muslim for me is a non-Muslim. Is that correct? It was meant to be provocative, and I and I gave an example of how you're reading. Uh, you could disagree with it, but it's not what I am saying. I'm rather saying sometimes reading and listening to you is structurally. You seem to be saying that Muslims should become like liberalized Christians or um, uh, you know secularized Jews. I mean, it is. Here's this thing. Uh, I think yes, Muslims should be like the Christians in America today, instead of the Christians of the Inquisition who are torturing Muslims and, and Jews to be Christians. So I think in every religion, there's a spectrum of views. And I think in Western Christianity, it's, it is a good thing that they stopped killing apostates, for example, right? I mean, so, I mean, nobody is being burned at the stake in America today for being a heretical Christian or Maybe no, no Muslim is being attacked for carrying out dawah. Probably if you did dawah in, uh, in 17th century Europe, you would be beheaded or something, something would happen to you. It doesn't happen to us today, so that's a good thing. When you say uh, Muslims should become like Jews, you aren't talking about in one respect. You're saying that's what Muslims should become like in a meaningful way. Uh, in a meaningful way, so that when they follow their Sharia, they follow the Sharia this, the same way that private secular Jews follow their halakha. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I do think, so this is not about Muslims being non-Muslims. It's just, I think, uh, the transformation that has happened in, uh, in the Western world regarding religious freedom is fundamentally a good thing. And I think by reason we observe that i mean you are living in america i'm living in america now and muhammad is living in uk i think we appreciate the fact that muslims can christians can convert to islam become murtads of christianity and we welcome them as our brothers and nobody chases them so that's intuitively a good thing so and and regarding judaism that's what i said i mean a few times uh orthodox jews ultra orthodox jews they follow the halakha in the way they believe in it, go to Brooklyn, I mean, we see them, right? But they're not necessarily condemning other Jews, at least in a, a coercive way, for actually they condemn, I mean, Israeli Orthodox Jews doesn't re recognize uh, Reform Judaism here, but it doesn't lead to executions, that kind of stuff that we tend to see in certain parts of the Muslim world or that uh, elements of coercion. 
And I think if there's a lesson from Judaism is that it disassociated itself from the state by reasons that it didn't want it. I mean, like 2000 years ago, but it was able to preserve itself and became a successful element in the modern world. So there is a story there that you don't necessarily need this. You need a state that upholds rights and justice, but you don't need necessarily a state that will associate with your religion in itself. That's why Jews become defenders of liberalism and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I understand you put it in a provocative way, but I would say... You don't recognize Zionism as is a thing for Jews. It's yes, and Zionism the- was a part of... Uh, is a, Zionism was the product of the collapse of the Jewish intention to integrate into modern society, because of partly because of anti-Semitism. Uh, it's, uh, it didn't come out of Ottoman Jews because Ottoman Jews were happy uh, to be Ottoman Jews. It, because of the fascism, because of the uh, anti-Semitism, the, uh, and it's a problem we didn't have, but the Christians had. But do you think the, the Muslim question might end up like the Jewish question? Uh, I don't think the Muslim presence in the world is that weak as a minority. We have a whole big ummah. God forbid something happens, people can go. But I, And I don't think something like Nazism hopefully will never emerge in the West, but it's a risk. That's why I'm I'm worried about it's a, it's a it's a it's a hope against hope it's a hope against reason and data and history but I mean that is why I would defend liberalism I mean the antidote to nazism is uh, or whatever alt right whatever I mean who wants to target or french uh, secularism I mean it's not of course a nazi level but it's certainly suppressing rules so what is the principle on which we rely against those threats it is classical liberalism. It's the idea that everybody is equal under the law. It's that Muslims have no just feeling. I mean, what I'm saying, no, no, I'm saying two different things. I'm saying two different things. God forbid if there emerges a white supremacist, neo Nazi West, which Muslims are under a threat of extinction. At least, I mean, our situation is as as a as the global umma is not as precarious as probably the Jewish situation. I hope that will not happen, and I will fight against that in the West. And I think the the principle to fight against that in the West is the much hated liberalism, which says everybody has equal justice under the law, and Muslims are equal citizens. They cannot be deprived. If there is a Muslim ban, there is judiciary to protect your rights and that kind of stuff. So. I, and I think Muslims see the value of liberalism when they're persecuted minority, threatened. Like Indian Muslims are defending liberal principles against Hindutva in India today because they see Hindu nationalism as a very destructive, threatening force, which it is. Now, but, but, Mustafa, you made reference, if I, if I may add uh, very quickly, you made reference to the Jews under the Ottomans. And now you've just described that almost the only system that can guarantee the rights of uh, different denominations and different religions is is uh, you know the liberal ideology however i didn't say the only system because we know that when islam did have to use your term coercive power uh jews and christians and and other faiths hindus in in india uh lived in in highly plural societies and and were able to practice their religious faith probably yeah, that's something uh, i say proudly and the thing but i'll say one thing uh these standards change and evolved over time. In classical Islam, Ahl al-Kitab, and it was Jews and Christians extended later by the Hanafis to uh, Hindus and Buddhists, they were protected minorities. So they had indeed the best time. I mean, Jews had their best time in the past 2000 years. I mean, state of Israel is a different question, but in the Ottoman Empire, and it's Jewish historians themselves will, will say that to you because They had rights under the Ottomans that they didn't have before, but these things change over time. Uh, The idea of equal citizenship under the law became fashionable after the French Revolution, and Ottoman minorities began demanding that. And that's why the Ottomans ultimately brought the idea of equal citizenship with the Islahat uh, Edict of 1856 and the Ottoman Constitution of 1876, which uh, declared Ottomans as equal citizens of the empire. So it abolished the classical Dhimmi system because 
uh, I think you appreciate, I mean, you, you compare things to what's out there, right? So people appreciated the Vimy system in the Ottoman Empire when it was the best thing in the world. But when there was equal citizenship with equal rights, there was a demand for that. There was a lot of politics behind that too. And the Ottomans ultimately went towards that liberal direction. And the Ottoman experience could have continued. And if we didn't have the tragedy of Kemalism, I think today Turkey would be at a better place and maybe Duma would be at a better place. Which brings me to the second point of Obamir that I would passionately disagree with, which is that, I mean, all the dictators of the Muslim world, uh, Burgiba, MBS, uh, would be happy with me. I mean, I don't know, uh, like, uh, Obamir, if you've seen, follow my political writings, but I've been a very passionate critique of the secular dictatorships uh, in the Muslim world. That includes Kemalism, that includes Habib Burgiba of Tun Tunisia, also it includes the not secular, but anti-Islamist dictatorships of Mohammed bin Salman and be, uh, all that kind of stuff. And actually in my book, I criticize the Islamic aspects of the Islamic tradition, which preaches obedience to the ruler, even if he's a Zalim, as long as he upholds the Sharia in the basics, right? So, and I criticize actually Asharites, which I think you do too. <laughs> For, 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 for buying into that idea that you should uphold the ruler because the alternative is fitna. And uh, I criticize that in the traditional sense, in the modern sense, the thing is, I don't see them as liberals. I, I mean, and the problem is Muslim world never had liberalism. I mean, Ataturk was not a liberal. Ataturk was a secular autocrat. He was influ influenced by fascist Italy. There, if there were glimpses of liberalism, that was in Turkey under Turgut Özal in the 1980s which actually allowed the hijab to come to the campus in the first time. So it was a tolerance for everybody in Turkish society. So we had glimpses of that, but it didn't work. So I'm quite critical of secular authoritarianism. And the problem in the Muslim world is modernity came to the Muslim world in fascist forms. Ba'ath, you know, ba I mean, Ba'ath in Syria, in Iraq, uh, all the modernists, so therefore, I'm not arguing for secularization. I'm not arguing for secular dictatorship. And one more thing. I also make great emphasis on the fact that the traditional Islamic civilization had an important blessing, which was that the law was not made by the ruler. The Sharia was independent from the ruler. It was about the ruler. I have a new book coming. Oh, let me, I'll send you a copy happily. Why as a Muslim I defend liberty. And it starts, it has a chapter what we should revive from the Sharia. And I, I begin with the story of the Ottoman Sheikh al Islam uh, tr uh, trying, you know, uh, Ottoman Sultan for violating the rights of the Greek architect. So the idea that the judiciary is separate, so it was a blessing of the Islamic civilization. And in the modern era, we lost that. But I'll tell you that it, liberalism is the same idea. It, it brought the natural rights idea about the rulers, and that's. I mean, what we lost by sidelining the Sharia in the Muslim world, so we lost separation of powers, it, it thrived in the West with separation of powers in a natural law uh, perspective. Yeah, so I think that you seem to be suggesting that, look, the Sharia had many of those things and none of those things. Sharia, you, you, you on certain aspects of the Sharia, but not the Sharia. It's, it's like, again, as I said, I think that it is the, the elephant that has to do with, with how you're, you're sort of picking and choosing and failing to see the implications of some of your ideas. So I'm, I, I have to say that I am intrigued uh, by some of your ideas, appreciative of them. Um, I was reading a chapter on Ibn Rush, which I really liked. Um, but I think that if you if you just look you the, the you want the sharia to become a private code of private personal ethics yet at the same time you want the sharia to bring freedom how can sharia if it's not in fact the 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 ruling system the legal order could bring you anything other than uh you know other than uh, i don't know cheesecake and apple pie it is basically whatever, it's a cuisine in your world, but you can turn it on and turn it off. Through Makassid, and I know Makassid is a very vague idea that became fashionable in the past 50 years, but I think, uh, it, again, in my forthcoming book, 
why I defend liberty, which has a chapter on the Sharia and the blessings of the Sharia. Uh, I emphasize that the Maqasid al-Sharia, the five principles, by the way, to which Ibn Ashur added a sixth one, which is Hurriya, uh, which is freedom, you know, and, and Hurriya, and not just not being a slave, but in the more modern sense of Hurriya. Uh, and also that modern sense of Hurriya was, came with a semantic expansion of the word Hur. I mean, it was there, uh, so, but it just gained new uh, knowledge. So I think through Maqasid al-Sharia, we can have a prince, a sense of rights, a doctrine of rights, like the Bill of Rights that is in the U.S. Constitution. I mean, U.S. in the founding, sorry, not in the Constitution. So that, that the rights of individuals, rights of human beings for property, to life, to speak, to believe, to practice, are above all governments. All the Mohammed bin Salmans and uh, the Burgibas and Ataturks and Erdogans of the world, right? I mean, we, we can have that sort of philosophy. Let me, let me interrupt you here. Makast Sharia in the actual tradition from a Shatibi or before Al Ghazali or Ibn Timiya to, to Ibn Ashur uh, or even Al Raisuni, then they talk about Makast Sharia, they mean a way to interpret the Sharia. Yes. Whereas you mean a way to replace the Sharia. Because you're completely different it's, it's kind of a game that that you know it behooves us not to play you mean to replace the sharia whereas what they mean is how to make the sharia some of the the the, the rules um that lead to ambiguity how to interpret them better right exactly exactly i know and we are seeing the maqasid in a new light we being the modernists let's say interpreters in the sense and uh, i mean I, I address that in the book in, in classical era i mean let's call it what it is it's the rejection of sharia no it's not it's a rejection of sharia like as i would not be i mean if if i say if i look at certain injunctions about slavery in islam about the encouragement of freeing a neck as in the uh, said in the quran and take this as the abolition of slavery in the modern world today. Am I rejecting Sharia? Well, I'm actually upholding the spirit of the Sharia and uh, bringing it into a different conclusion today. So, and I'm not a mujtahid and I'm not a faqih. I'm not, I'm just saying we need new perspectives on these issues. I'm not gonna give you anything. I don't have such authority, but, but we need to have these discussions. And uh, ultimately, I, I, my book on the Sharia in, in Reopening Muslim, my, my chapter on the Sharia, which gets into these issues, what the Asharites saw in the Sharia Maqasid and how it was limited. Uh, they didn't have some Mutezala foundations. I mean, how much the Asharites went forward. I mean, I, I discussed these issues. I believe from the Sharia, from the Maqasid perspective, we Muslims can infer a system of rights through which we can develop an ijma of Muslims. And this can be the rights, a doctrine of rights that should be about all states, all Muslim states or other states. And we can, so we can connect these with the achievements of humanity. I mean, humanity has developed something called human rights. And do we agree with that or not? Does humanity have that authority to rational authority? So these are the issues I'm discussing, uh, but I will reject the <laughs> view really that I somehow uh, support the authoritarian regimes in the Muslim world. I've been passionately against that. One more thing, consent and coercion. Uh, that, I mean, I, I heard you mention this before to uh, Obamir. Like, I mean, people emphasize the idea of, you know, consent, but of course, consent is based on a lot of things. Are people really free and they're making choices? Now, people make, I mean, could, conservatives in our community make this argument to shed some doubt on some of the uh, preferences of the modern human being, right? I mean, they choose this, they choose that, but we, we are, they're going for Hawa, right? I mean, let's be honest here. And we're saying, well, are you really justified in that? Uh, do you, are you really free? And are you under the influence of culture and so on and so forth? That's a good argument. But the same argument can be used against us. I mean, look at how the French secularists are trying to ban hijab. They say, well, these Muslim women are uh, wearing hijab, but you know, they're under the influence of this patriarchal culture. Uh, we have to liberate them from their culture and so on and so forth. And I'm totally against that argument. So I- Yeah, but you are against on your ground, but I don't concede your ground. That's not the reason what we have, why we have a problem with the French doing it. So but anyway, you need a pr principle- but, but, to I argue that, against them. And if you say my principle is the Sharia, then that's not his principle. So do you have a universal principle which will allow us to live by the Sharia as we understand it 
And we can argue for the minority rights in France when they say, this is our way of life, this is our norms, this is our value in our society. So we are coercing you to, uh, to uh, subscribe, or when the Hindu, uh, Hindu nationalists do that in India. So I think we need a universal principle and that's why I value Ibn Rushd's emphasis on Sunan Gair Maktuba uh, and, and the Makassid perspective, which we can, with, through which we can connect with the rest of humanity and have a universal standard. Mustafa, I would like to ask you a question about uh, liberalism because you've you've spoken uh, about uh, the pluralism that came within Islamic history, and it's a, it's a very rich history, a respectful, tolerant history, as we as we described. And uh, uh, it seems to me that liberalism uh, seeks more from minority communities in exchange for integration than Islam ever did. I mean, I uh, the the writer here in in the UK, um, philosopher and and, and uh, member of the House of Lords, Bikul Parekh, talks about how liberalism um, it requires a thick layer of ex- of adoption before it can accept it can gain acceptance from a minority community. Um, whereas this Islam, you know, in 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 history, did not require that. You know, a well, Islam, in, we demanded the super, the recognition of the supremacy of Islam. Supremacy of Islam is not the same thing as demanding, you know, citizenship with equal rights under specific... No, universalism, you see what you just did. For you, you're okay with a man-made doctrine that has actually no philosophical foundation, no philosophical agreement about where liberal rights come from. You are willing to make that a universal principle but what you are not willing to do is accept that God's revelation, God's truth, is the universal principle on well, the basis of which we accept. Well, very good. Revelation. Tell me what, what you think about the Medina uh, constitution. I mean, it didn't make God's revelation the basis of the city of Medina. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it didn't. It did, actually. I have an article on it. Please read it. I have, uh, I have shown, I think, in great detail that these modern Muslim readings are completely bankrupt. I mean, that's just, that's just fairly, I do a very... Okay, I mean, there are people who disagree on that, but what I would say is that, of course... I mean, modern academics course. don't, only Muslim apologists do. If you read modern academics, that is Western scholars, as well as traditional scholars, nobody ever read... Okay, I'll uh, read your article, but what I was going to say is that the Medina Treaty does not accept from the Jews to accept the supremacy of Islam. They, they just recognize Prophet Muhammad as the head of the Muslim community and to their religion and to Muslim, to their religion. And Medina is not a Islamic state in that definition. It's a state where Muslims live with Jews. So I think Muslims... It's not a state to begin with, and I show that in It's the a article. polity, let's say, call it's it. It's not a state or polity until, uh, this, until the sixth year of Arabia when Jews are gone anyway. Okay, I'll read your article on that. Uh, and yeah. I, I know there are different readings of the Medina Treaty. What, what I'm saying is that, of course, you need a man-made law to agree with. Of course, because... No, no, what no, you... no. It's not a man-made law. It's rather the principle on which you are saying that you should accept uh, the terms of living here. You are saying that liberal principles, for example, human rights, human, human life is sacred. Where does that come from? Human beings are all equal. Where does that come from? There is no rational Well, it foundation. comes from no. both our religious traditions and both from human conscience, which I see as a No, there is no such thing. There is no philosophical agreement on that today. You should know that. There doesn't have to be an agreement. And I myself, I, I mean, for, you know, U.S. founders, they said we hold these rights self-evident, right? Everybody has life. Because they, they are reading the Bible. Yes. And, and but... But to agree on that principle, I can agree on that principle coming from the Quran too. And we can agree on the rights of men, rights of human beings. Me from my own reading of the Quran, they from their reading of the Bible. And an atheist comes... Yes, even for John Locke, that's what it was. You know, that's why John Locke couldn't understand and couldn't include atheists. Because that's where it, his perspective on tolerance was coming from. John Locke didn't uh, include atheists. Later, the U.S. founders did. And, you know, Roger Williams and others did. I mean, because liberalism evolved over so time. What happens is that you, you have this doctrine of, which is called, it's sort of what, what, I, what some scholars have called smuggling. Liberalism smuggles values 
but these are what I call levitating values, meaning that they have no foundation in either philosophy or revelation, and that is why they're open to the highest bidder. That's why capitalism has run amok. And if you allow me, uh, what I think is the real problem that liberalism poses, and I know that you 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 are uh, uh, you know you don't accept liberalism without qualifications, but I think that um, if I may, the real problem facing humanity, our economic inequality, the great looting of the world by the West through colonialism and, and continued uh, global capitalism and the great rape of nature that has led to far more uh, decisive crisis that we face today, the ecolo ecological apocalypse. Now, uh, all of these things you set aside when thinking about Muslim problems. I mean, most Muslims, like nearly 800, 900 a million people in the world are likely to be without home uh, or underwater, uh, in, you know, in 50 years or so. And with that being the problem, you are talking about how, you know, uh, Malaysian police uh, arrested you for this or that. It, it is as if you have, you know, really serious problems. Uh, like, you know, a, a, a kind of like an injured person walks in into your emergency room where, who's been raped and who's, uh, who's bleeding, and you look at their shirt and say, oh, that's a racist shirt, I'm not going to treat that person, or like, that's the real problem that we got to, no, that's terrorism and intolerance are distractions. They are the sins of the poor, the underlings, the people who do not have, admittedly, uh, functioning legitimate systems. They do not have uh, institutions where ethical deliberation can take place. I grant you that. But you got to look beyond that. What are the forces that are uh, perpetuating that? And until you equally consider, at least equally address those forces of capitalism, for instance, global capitalism is single most important uh, 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 culprit in creating inequality and the destruction of the very planet that we have. I mean, Mustafa, I would like your, your, your take on that. I mean, it isn't liberalism questioned around the world. And it's in many ways, it's, it's in the retreat. It's in the retreat. It's in the retreat for all the forces that are threatening our uh, religious freedoms, like far right uh, or far left uh, in America and uh, China, and another power. So but what about the concerns the concerns over me. I'll, I'll about speak about that. Just one thing. Uh, yes, I do. And the whole idea that I, I mean, the reason I speak about Ibn Rushd or Farabi or Ibn, uh, Hai, uh, Ibn Yaksan and all that is that I do believe that God has blessed humanity, not just with revelation, but also reason. That includes conscience and some intuitive truths. And they evolve over time and they need that dialogue of their own and we need both of them and i think with others with non-muslims we cannot agree on revelation they're not going to accept that quran is a revelation and islam is the truth but we can agree on living in a civic order where we will be muslims in the way we believe it and they will be christians or atheists or whatever they want to be and that is liberalism and i, I do find that legitimate how do i find that legitimate well a million things but i'll just say that i do believe that human mind and human experience with bad experiences can have the authority to establish political systems which can, which can establish justice. That's what Farabi was speaking about when you know he's speaking about the uh, Greek models of governance. Coming back, to he was talking about more absolutism, man, than the world ever had. What are you talking about? Farabi's prophet king was and was. Well, Arabi was influenced by Plato. He was indeed speaking of the prophet king, but he also, another model, he says, speaks of a city of Hurria, where all the philosophers and poets and come and the city thrives. So he's speaking of different five models. Yeah, it's like people people like him who have accepted Greek philosophy, people, philosophers who are free. Yeah, philosophers I mean, were at the time were also people who did medicine and everything. Like, Farabi also sees philosopher king as the prophet, as prophet Muhammad. So he, he likens the prophetic model to the Plato's model. So Farabi has 
different models as Plato did. And Plato's ideas were not the best from the Greek tradition. Aristotle- It's the worst dictatorship. Let's just accept that, okay? What Plato- I accept that. And I'm a critic of Plato. I mean, it goes back to Karl Popper's criticism. I'm just saying that the idea that human might- Democracy. Well, that's a Greek idea, right? I mean, a lot of Muslims don't see an incompatibility with democracy in the modern world today, which would replace all the Mohammed bin Salmans and Burgibas of the world that you're criticizing with it. So it's a part of the it's it's a part of the human mind because I believe God gave humans the capacity, the fitra, you know. To and and I think your emphasis on fitra uh, of the fitra emphasis of uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, and I think is there is something there. Coming back to the all these discussions about how liberalism destroyed the modern world, well, I'll tell you something. All the problems you're discussing about environment, this is not this is not about liberalism. It's about industrialization, right? The world became more industrial in the past few centuries, and in you can be industrial and you can be communist, as the Soviet Union was, as North Korea is today. You can be industrial and then have an Islamic system of governance, as they have in Iran. So this, and when you industrialize, yes, there is, I mean, you will, yes, harm the nature to some extent, but let's not forget that the world today is feeding 7 billion people unless 1 billion people two centuries ago. So 7 billion people are being fed and, and given shelter and so on. So we're the different governments and political systems, some of which are liberal, some of which are not. So the idea that this is all the blame of liberalism and if we are not liberal, this will all go away like if you're all communists, the environment will be better. Or if you have all Islamic states, won't those Islamic states you know, give shelter to their people, have AC or, I mean, if, if you want to go back to a pre-industrial world, pre-industrial yeah, yeah. world. So the answer to all that question is, it seems to me, Mustafa, that's one thing that we perhaps can, I can suggest some readings, including what I have written about that, yes, I think that the destruction of community by liberalism and capitalism is the single most important reason why um, the world, the, the industrial industrialism went in the direction that it did, that in fact, consumerism became the new religion. And, they, and the destruction of the community is the reason why both the morals are breaking down, but, uh, and, but also um, the, the reason why people seek their leisure happiness in consumption of material goods is precisely because, because liberal capitalism has destroyed communities, religions, and, the, and, and really uh, this kind of conspicuous uh, uh, consumption, which uh, is, is a need for capitalism. Capitalism nearly forces it upon the world through both advertisement and through coups around the world in third world countries that they don't accept its terms throughout the world, multinational corporations are doing that. So come on, man, there is like very, there's like literally hundreds of scholars uh, who are uh, scientists who are talking about what, that we need to do something about capitalism. And it's really, it's, it's twin is uh, liberalism. Now, Mind you, I don't mean by rolling back liberalism necessarily getting rid of all the human rights, um, but rather you don't want to, what, what you need to roll back, I think, is individualism. And which means that we need to bring back a different view of the world and community-centered view of the world, which does mean that liberalism, liberal capitalism, individualism, that those are going to be the main targets of any serious critique, which is not to say again, that you go to communism or uh, Mohammed bin Salman or Ataturk, uh, and on that I'm 100% with you. And I also agree with you that the global institutions uh, and, and national institutions and the consensus on certain rights, those are not necessarily timeless truths, but they are useful institutions. So again, the, the difference between you and me, I see them as useful not some kind of, uh, you know, sort of sacred truths by which then I'm going to judge revelation and, and reason and, and, and tradition, but rather these are useful agreements that we need to, uh, we, we need to ground in, in pulling in our own tradition, uh, but with concern for coherence, with concern, which I seem to see that 
you are losing when you are approaching revelation with almost explicit intention to say, I'm going to be selective with revelation. I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to fazlur rahmanize the Quran if I have to in order to get rid of this part. I'm going to reject hadith Mustafa, if I have to. Yes. Here's what I can say. Uh, I mean, Omar, some of the things you said, I would agree with you on the, I mean, military coups that the U.S. supported in different parts of the world against the government that it didn't find helpful to itself, or the same thing for other powers like Russia or China today. There are a lot of, I mean, there are a lot of things in the modern world that are destructive, and I agree with you all that. I'm just saying that there are things that come simply out of industrialization, not necessarily liberalism as such, and you would have industrialization in a non-liberal order. Look at how China is doing things to the environment today, and it's not a liberal country. It adopted to the market economy to feed its population, and then it, you have other results. So as Muslims, we, we're, we don't have to welcome this world saying this is the most wonderful thing we have ever seen. As Muslims, we have have objections to these things. But I think to, be, have, to have those objections, to make them meaningful, we have to figure out the problems within our own midst. And I think that I see the problem of relying on coercion in matters of religion as a problem, which prevents us from manifesting the values of Islam in the modern world today. I mean, people will see, oh, my God, somebody gets jailed for apostasy in this country or that country. Well, I would like I think there are better values of Islam. And instead of insisting on those kind of certain uh, things that I don't think even even not in the Quran and even I don't think is uh, should be a part of the Islamic tradition, and I think because it was contextual. Now, am I selective about the Quran? Yes, as our scholars were selective about the Quran. I no, mean, they never, why, they never accepted whoa, that. that. Wait, 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 wait. That's why, why, why abrogation was developed to abrogate the verses that don't go with the idea of aggressive jihad. I mean, why the Kum Dinikum Deen was abrogated? Why? I mean, because... Lekum dinukum waliyadin never meant what, what anything against jihad. They simply meant, I'm not going to compromise my religion. It never said you have a religion. The Prophet at the same time is calling them. Yes, but many verses like that have been considered abrogated. Many verses like that have been abro- considered abrogated by our... So the abrogation was, was, abrogation was seen as, well, by those who accepted uh, extensive versions of it. I mean, everybody accepts it, but it was uh, seen as pro- progression that is within the Quran. So the Quran itself intended. Now, the same thing. If you can show me that your verses that you want to abrogate or take out of the Quran or reject are to be rejected by an internal logic, right? There is some evidence. I'm not it. calling for rejecting anything. Nauzubillah, not in the Quran. I'm not calling for rejecting anything. I'm actually just saying we should look into the doc- abrogation doctrine. And, you know, Asma Afsaruddin, our friend, has uh, written about this. I mean, how the idea that the earlier verses about coexistence or not co- Prophet Muhammad not being a compeller and uh, to you, your religion, to me, mine, and even La Ikraha Fiddin have been considered abrogated. Only Based by on... your Mu'tazilite friends, by the way. Nobody else did. Only your Mu'tazilite no, friends. No, 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 no. It is yes. no, the whole Sunni jurisprudence. No. I mean, we can. No, no. no. Well, it's in my book. I mean, I like the, I mean, the whole abrogation. I mean, the thing is, scholars don't agree how many verses have been abrogated. But I'll tell you that Asma of Suruddin says the scholars who were more I, uh, affiliated with the Umayyad empire were more into abrogating the more peaceful verses of the Quran. I mean, it's a known fact that this abrogation came. And um, it, it's not just Mutezilites. I mean, Mutezilites, actually Mutezilites insisted on taxis. At least one Mutezilite scholar insisted that there is no abrogation in the Quran. There is just taxis. No, no, no. On the question of Ikra, La Ikra Hafidin is what I meant. Okay. They are the La, only... Ikra Hafidin. La Ikra Hafidin. They actually said, they didn't abrogate it. They just said this is actually de- descriptive, not prescriptive. So there was right. that Mutezilite interpretation. which that... But the actual, all, actual Sunni tradition accepted that. No, there are people who, abrog- who consider it abrogated. I'll, I'll show you the, I mean... There is, there are certainly verses that have been considered abrogated. And I'm saying 
they consider them abrogated because not because a necessary logic within the Quran itself, because the, the word nest, I mean, the words about the nest doesn't have to be understood in that sense. It can be the abrogation of earlier revelations, but they understood in that way because it made sense to them in their day and age, in the Byzantine and Sassanid Empire time, having war and jihad and, you know, Qatar in the name of that, that made sense. That was actually maybe justified. No, no, but you, they, they, this is never the reason. I mean, the, you, the reason, I agree with you until you gave your reason, right? They always give a reason. You could, and this was a matter of ijtihad, of course, in some cases. In other cases, it's very clear that one verse about old fasting has been abrogated by the new verse about fasting Ramadan. But there were other cases about the phases of jihad. And of course, after Surah at tawbah the last years, uh, when uh, in the time of the Prophet وسلم, in fact, there was the, the battles went out to uh, Syria, Mu'ta, and then Tabuk. Uh, so this was a prophet who starts the engagement with uh, with jihad against Syria because Allah says, min al -kufar. So they said, okay, what does this mean that earlier verses uh, between uh, the second year until the eighth year of Hijrah? Uh, and and there were some ulama, uh, you know, both uh, the Hanafis and the rest, who said that uh, they have not been abrogated, but rather they belong to a different phase. And then there are other ulama who said, you know, they have been abrogated, but by the word abrogation, they meant something different than we do, which is tasis. Limitations. Um, it, this, is, this is internal, internal debate. Yeah, so it, it's the, 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 no one, no scholar of Islam, could call themselves that if they did what you said you are doing or what they were doing, right? They would never say that, let's be selective with the Quran. So let's be clear about that. They, they never said that, but they intuitive. The thing is, uh, Obamir, there are reasons our scholars explicitly said and wonderful. And there are reasons our scholars wouldn't explicitly say because they didn't even notice because they were living in the time and milieu. And I'm saying that we are living in a different time and milieu. I mean, even the war, apostasy war, the Ridda wars, it's a disputed issue. Caliph, Caliph Abu Bakr decided to go with that. Actually, Umar ibn al-Hattab was not in favor of it in the beginning. Ultimately, what the Caliph did, uh, made the decision and happened. And it was a human decision. And I understand that it was the time and milieu, but maybe, but if the other view dominated, maybe there would be no Ridda wars and the history of Islam would be different. No, there, there was no other view. Sorry, the Prophet, it had started the time of the Prophet ﷺ because uh, Ridda happened in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. So Abu Bakr's decision and Abu uh, Umar was only whether it's too dangerous, not whether it's... A, a tactical decision, yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but if, if, if I may, Mustafa, I think that one major difference that I see, uh, and I think that's really hard... I, you know, you have read my book and I read other stuff and I write other stuff where I am critical of the tradition, the chunks of tradition. I agree with you that their culture, history, uh, sectarian concerns sometimes overwhelm them. But the reason why we remain part of a tradition is because we never say that I will set aside some part of the Quran. I always have to find an explanation and then I can come back and say, you were not right about this. And that's what makes us part of the tradition, that our sincerity and commitment that whatever Allah says is what we're going to take. Whereas if somebody, a modernist comes and look, I'm going to start with some premises from the modern world. Let's say uh, homosexuality. I'm going to start with homosexuality and then say that this is a basic human right. And then I'm going to go to the Quran and say, everything that seems to go against it in the sunnah, everything goes, I am not, I'm going to reject it. That is not a sincere engagement with the Quran and the Sunnah. And that's not my engagement. You know, I understand. I, I, I'm not. But you I, I'm seem not, to suggest I'm that not, very strongly in some of your statements. No, I mean, I, I never disregard anything in the Quran. Quite the contrary, I see, I believe in seeing the Quran not abrogated. And yes, Tafsis and uh, all, the, this, all these different verses of the Quran will be addressing certain different situations. I'm critical of the abrogation view to actually get rid of getting rid of certain injunctions in the Quran about pluralism and tolerance and non-coercion. Uh, when it comes to when it comes to Fazlur Rahman and that sort of reading, 
yes, there are. There is a contextual reading of the Quran, and I, I know you see a lot of hawa and that kind of thing in there. But when I see the Quran, and when I see the post Quranic society, and when I see things like, for example, oh, there are corporal punishments in the Quran, and why? Well, there are cor- corporal punishments already there. So I do read the Quran text contextually to understand what is the intention there. So that is that itself is not disrespect. I mean. The idea that rethinking certain things in our tradition is disrespect to the revelation itself. I mean, I don't, at least I, that's not my approach. At least I hope but, I'm not but, doing but, that. Mustafa, is that how, Mustafa, if I may say, how, how genuine is, is that claim? I mean, I suppose what, what Omar is, is arguing is that you've, you've come to the revelation and to Islamic scholarly history with a, an embrace of liberalism. And so then you, and again, I, I don't mean this as an offensive term, you cherry pick, uh, and maybe sometimes um, you, you, you possibly can exaggerate uh, the claim made by the scholar, Ibn Rushd or whoever, uh, and in order, to, uh, in order to conform to your starting point, which is a liberal position. So when, when Alvaro says that you're, you know, potentially you're, you're uh, seeing the Quran through that liberal lens, I think I think there is a I mean I think one would have to admit that is how you're so you're interpreting the text according to those principles so that it it aligns as much as possible to liberalism. Whereas I suppose Obama's argument is that there is a rich Islamic history and that rich Islamic history has its ups and downs and and sometimes scholars got it wrong and sometimes scholars. May have acted in a malign way, even you know. He, I think he he accepts that, but and, and I'm looking into that scholarship, and I'm uh, seeking ideas and highlighting the ideas that resonate what you call liberalism today. Uh, that I would call a system of law. But, but isn't that a is isn't that disingenuous if you approach the Quran? No, because I fic- I believe the traditional interpretation also happened in a context with there were political interests and there were cultures and it was a certain time and milieu so it all i mean revelation came to not a vacuum but to society and to political structures of the time inevitably and our scholars did their best to understand we are not better than them we just live in a dramatically different world over, over there, um, uh, Mustafa made a point at the very beginning. I know, I know we are, uh, we're running out of time here, but uh, Mustafa's point was about slavery. Slavery existed in the Sharia, and uh, when it became um, uh, unacceptable according to modernity, according to liberalism, Muslims reinterpreted the text in order to outlaw slavery. I mean, is, is that a recognition that this approach of Mustafa may have some value? Um, in, in today's world? I think the approach that Mustafa has is there is what, what he says in, in some times and what he says some other times. And that's why I'm having trouble understanding what that approach is. Is he coming in with a very clear liberal modern agenda and going and selecting uh, verses? Or is he genuinely interested in what the Quran has to say and then deriving his agenda from there and then adjusting his agenda as soon as he learns a new verse in the Quran or a new now, of course, he rejects hadith. I'm sorry, Mr. I don't mean to talk. Oh, Amir, I don't reject hadith per se. I, I am, I am cautious against uh, hadith that are not mutawatir. Okay, so you're only talking about mutawatir hadith. You're against a uh, had hadith. I'm not against it. I would have caution in the sense that I would judge a solitary hadith, a Habar al-Wahid, a had hadith with the Quran and with uh, reason as human intuition of moral values. Yeah, but in that sense, you're not different from most of the ulama. Most of the ulama would say that again, but when you- Well, it, it, this is the Ahl al ray position, not the Ahl al-Hadith position. No, well, so when you say Ahl al-Hadith, even there you made a statement that Ahl al-Ahad hadith was not, uh, Ahl hadith was considered vanni by the Mu'tazila and by some of Ahl al-Kalam, that is true. But in law, they considered... They accepted it, yes. Nevertheless, allow me to say that if you are following Fadl Rahman, and it seems to me that from your book and earlier conversation, I've heard that um, you reject hadith not on the basis of, or accept hadith, not on the basis of kind of hadith analysis, but based on how it sounds. Um, but even going back to the Quran, you said that the Quran came at a time when there was coercion, and and so that's what it was. But you see in the Quran the verses talking about 
uh, punishing uh, hudud, that do not let compassion overtake you. That in fact, it is, uh, it is not something that the Arabs did. And the Quran, in fact, emphasized, uh, emphasized it. There was, uh, um, uh, and the Jews had figured out, for example, a way to do away with, with stoning. There's a stoning in the Quran. I mean, as for zina. That's... Well, so it is if you if you take it if you take it explicitly, but the the context of those verses is precisely that the Jews were trying to avoid the punishment or lapidation for for zina. And anyway, going back, the the Quran in fact addresses the um, the Muslims and says, let not not be compassion. This is not time for compassion. Let afubim ra'fatan. So. Yeah, my point, my point is that this the, 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 the zina was not considered punishable uh, offense, uh, was considered so harsh that the Prophet وسلم, had to, you know, uh, emphasize it and, uh, and had to say that I'm going to do it even to my own daughter. So I don't think that... I said uh, the Arabs did it for amputation of hands for theft. But, but take the, the zina, the zina example, Mustafa. I mean, it, you know. But even even amputation for hands was not something that was, you know, it was something that was known, but not regularly carried out. It wasn't something that just the same as uh, bur uh, burying of daughters. It wasn't something that every daughter was buried was uh, was born was buried. It was something that. Just sometimes it was done, um, but for the Quran to make it a law, I mean, you have to reckon with the fact that the Quran makes it a law, and uh, and then says, "Do not be soft about it." That's that's not a um, that that's not a uh, the Quran simply adjusting. If it is infinite, infinitely wise Lord who is giving this law for all times. Um, and for all people, um, and says, um, it's not a minor thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, tells you that these hudud are serious. So it's not that, uh, you know, you're, you're reading the Quran in a way that uh, is, is so forced that you're not even looking at other verses in the Quran, you're not looking at the context. Well, I am. What I say about, I mean, let me clarify my what I said there. There are certain hudud in the Quran, and I have no doubt about that. I know them. Uh, the, the, I mean, I have, two, I have two emphases on that issue. One is that the Quranic hudud are for acts that can be considered as crimes universally in the sense that they have a victim. Theft, murder, uh, false accusation of adultery. And adultery, too, Especially if adult, what adultery means is actually not that clear. The Islamic tradition took it as premarital and extramarital sex. But if uh, scholars like Abdul and Rashid Rida had the idea that zina is only the uh, extramarital sex, that is like a violation of the religious bond, which makes the other one not halal, but maybe not a crime. So that is one. That's... But it's a victimless crime, isn't no, it? No, you, you're you, cheating on somebody. Are you, you're, are you saying you're breaking the lineage? In your system, are you? No, no, no. Okay. You so are. You're cheating on somebody. Are you you're cheating to on a? Why? Probably more importantly, you're you're breaking lineage. I mean, it's it doesn't become clear who's the who the child who's the father of the child. So you're actually confusing lineage, which is one of the five maqasid of the Sharia. Now this is this so is about the of nature of fahisha is bad, but. Not every fahisha is maybe a crime. I mean, there are things that the Quran condemns, but does not penalize. So I, I made this emphasis That's true, but... for, to distinguish between crime and sin for the Quran. They're not exactly the same thing. So, so this is just one argument. The other argument... So in your recommendation, do you think Muslims should have hudud, the ones that are in the Quran? I think in the Quran, yes, in a Muslim society. The only thing I would say is that why is the Quran always ordering for corporal punishment? Do you know everything about what's in God's mind? I don't. And that's what the Muslim ulama accept. That certain things are given by God as command and you don't ask. Uh, when God gives wisdom, you try to understand that wisdom. So I understand that, but I would agree with scholars like Fazur Rahman is that because corporal punishment was the only available 
norm in that society. But scholars like Fazl Rahman also said that the Prophet ﷺ was making up stuff in order to respond as when, when Christians and Jews rejected his message. So he makes the Quran dependent on the Prophet uh, in his early writing. I don't know if he does that to, toward the end. And uh, you cannot take the error of a scholar, and I do respect Fazl Rahman, but he also makes grave errors. Um, and one of them is that he thinks that the prophet changed his tone, changed in the Quran, because the, the Quran is filtered through the prophet's feelings. Uh, and that's, uh, that's considered fairly blasphemous by, um, I think, anyone who takes the Quran to be divine word. And I think that Fadl Rahman is following Avicenna and understanding of, of, uh, of uh, psychology at that time, which it seems, from what I understand, he abandoned toward the end of his life. He, but in his early life, when he followed Avicenna, he really understood the Quran to be, in, in Avicenna in sense, as a sort of, sort of a psychological, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, genius of the prophet. Uh, I don't uh, subscribe to the views. I don't know how much Fazl Rahman wrote on that. I mean, I know in his earlier books, you Revelation and Islam, I think you were mentioning that. I don't, I, I'm not among those people who suggest that the prophet had a role in the formation of the revelation. I take revelation as revelation. Okay, well, that's great to know, because then you shouldn't agree with Fazl Rahman. Well, I, I agree with Fazl Rahman on the contextuality of the text, not on whether revelation, in which revelation prophet has a role or not. I'm not saying that that is gaib, and I will not speculate about that. I will have faith there. But I do see the contextuality of the revelation. The re revelation is legislating things which were in the society that received the revelation. Uh, the forbidden months, zihar. These are things that Arabs had, and revelation legislated these things. So I would look, the, we don't have those things anymore. Nobody has forbidden months anymore. Even Arabs don't have forbidden months anymore. So revelation legislated things that it found in its immediate context. So I would make a distinction between uh, the constraint of, constraints of the context and the eternal principles of the revelation. So that's all I can say. So I would see corporal punishments in the Quran as something necessitated by the context. There was no alternative and it was things were done. But I would there extract the idea that crime should be punished and the Quranic crimes are crimes. Theft, murder, brigandage are crimes. And adultery would be crime in the sense of confusing lineage. And a false accusation of adultery on women would be also, because that would put that woman's life in jeopardy. Whereas I would say the Quran doesn't penalize other things that it sees as haram, but, but they were later penalized by Qiyas. And I think that's a, respect, I mean, that's a disputable position. So that was my argument on that issue. So if, if, um, Muhammad, I could, if, I, if I could respond to the question that you asked, I think it's pretty important and it's, it features fairly centrally in Mustafa's work, so, which is the question of slavery and how is it that we accept the abolition of slavery, which of course I think is a good thing, um, and not say, for instance, uh, this can, can, why can we not do the same thing for the verses on hijab or alcohol ban or jihad or homosexuality or parasty or sex with animals or incest or all kinds of things or burning widows, all kinds of things that cultures that Muslims interacted with, and this was always the pressure. Uh, where do you put limits on individual hawa? Where do you put limits on individual interpretation? Uh, Mustafa may not agree with pederasty uh, or may not agree with uh, incest, but other people do not have a problem with that. How do we know that's not an individual right? Where do we decide this? Well, you decide that within the Quran, within the text, the Quran and the Sunnah and slavery, for instance, is categorically different from say hijab or prohibition of zina or alcohol and other things. Why? Because there is no command to make slaves in the Quran. The only commands very frequently that appear in the Quran are to free the slaves. Now there is no, nothing about abolition, but there is no command. So in other words, slavery um, was something that uh, the abolition would be considered. If you were to ask a juris, jurisprudential position, the abolition would be mubah, and if possible, right, if, if it's seen as something possible, it would be even good because um, a slave is, slavery is considered a negative condition. It's just not considered the absolute evil uh, as it is in the abolitionist canon, 
but which is very, very modern. And I think that abolitionist canon doesn't work uh, even for philosophers, historians, and anthropologists, anybody who's a serious scholar, when you look at this ideology of abolitionism, it becomes uh, impossible to maintain uh, because we don't have any foundation for it. But uh, as a political construct, as an agreement, as something that we agree with and that, that is good, that people should not have to be slaves, um, I think that's a good thing because it agrees with, as Mustafa says correctly, with the maqasid of the sharia and many other scholars have, and there is no particular command for it. That's not the case with other things that we are talking about. So I think that my, the, the big difference in, I guess, my approach and Mustafa's approach is I look at the logic, the system, the rationality of the sharia by looking at contexts historically accurate, contextualized understanding of the Quran, contextualized understanding the meaning, but I don't limit the contextualized understanding to be uh, relevant only for the time of the Prophet ﷺ, right? So these are timeless uh, commandments, but in order to understand what was timeless about them and what is universal and what is particular, you need to go back to the text and to the Quran and the Sunnah. In fact, you cannot understand the Quran without the Sunnah, because the Quran sometimes becomes incoherent without the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And sometimes that Sunnah is available to us only uh, in a hard form. For example, uh, to give you one quick example, in Surah An-Nisa, there are two verses, verse 8 and very last verse, which gives you two different shares for brothers uh, of the deceased, brothers and sisters, siblings of the deceased. One says, brothers and sisters get the same share. The other one says brothers get twice uh, the sister. The, this is the case of Kalala. Uh, this is clear contradiction in the Quran. And the Quran says there is no contradiction in it. So either the Quran is not right on this, or you say that Quran's understanding can be completed only when combined with the understanding of the Sunnah. And in this case, the Hadith, almost everybody accepts it's a had Hadith, that one is talking about uh, full sister brothers and one uh, on, on the mother's side and one uh, on, on the father's side. But that distinction, unless you get it from an ahad hadith, the Quran becomes in com a, a clear contradiction and goes against its own claim uh, that there can be no contradiction in God's word. So my point is that in order to understand the Quran, you have to take its context as an integral part of it, not something that comes in uh, later. Which I fully agree with. I mean, and, and, I, okay. and I would, the, the only thing, the distinction I would make there is that, I mean, Ahad Hadith's Sira literature give us invaluable information about the context and the story of the life of Prophet himself. Uh, it's just, uh, I, I take the Ehlurai view that you know, solitary Hadiths are not Kat'i, they're not uh, certain, uh, certainly not on the Akida, but also jurisprudentially, if they conflict with the, with the general principle of the Quran, which I see in like Rahafiddin, I would be cautious about them. So, but without hadith, without sirah, uh, and without just historical information, it could be something written by some Christian observers of early Islam. So anything, any historical information is needed because the Quran speaks to a co context without generally, most of the time doesn't explain you what is happening, but the earliest recipients knew what happened. So yeah, we need that. I'm not a Quranist. That is, I think, I find a very shallow understanding, saying that we read the Quran okay. and understand everything. Then, so that, Then we don't really disagree. And then I think it just comes down to getting to the trenches, if you will, and okay. figuring out. I'll, I'll tell you one more thing. I mean, if you have a few more time. Like, this whole discussion on liberalism reminds me of the discussion about democracy. When, when I was in college, like 20, uh, 25 years ago, among the Islamic circles in Turkey, there was the discussion about democracy. Was it kufr? Or was it something good, right? Uh, well, some people are saying it came from the kafir, kafirun. I mean, it came, it's, it's just a system of the infidels. Look at even if it sounds Greek and everything. But others were saying, oh, there is shura, you know, in the Quran. So it's a developed form of shura. So the sh shura obviously isn't democracy as such. But shura is an idea of consultation, which actually Ottoman liberals like Naam Kemal in the 19th century found as a basis in the Quran to introduced the idea of an elected parliament to the Ottoman Empire. And I think democracy is an achievement of humanity. It is better than despotic rule. Now, what's the alternative to democracy? Absolute monarchy, let's say. Um, a monarchical milk, you know, the, uh, from father to son. 
uh, or a hered- hereditary monarchy. Well, did Islamic civilization have this? Yes. I mean, from beginning from Umayyads. Was this a part of Islam? No, it was a historical condition. Today, if we embrace democracy for Muslim societies, which I advocate, so I'm against all the Mohammed bin Salmans and Burgibas and that kind of people in the Muslim world, will we be going again? Will we be introducing an innovation? Well, yes. But is this going against the Quran? I mean, is this going against the spirit of the Quran? If you take Shura as an inspiration or other verses that can be relevant? No, I see the idea of liberalism as a system of rights that are guaranteed in a limited state, which includes property rights, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, things that I think we need in the modern world to be able to practice their religion as something like that. I'm not saying early Islam had it. I'm not, but early Islam had things which was just contextual and it was like hereditary monarchy. And today, if there's something better, which humanity has developed through experience, uh, I would be open to that. So that's, I, and I'm not, dogmatically advocating this or that i'm just saying we have a problem with coercion in the name of religion and this is not this may have helped religion in some setting it's not even helping uh, I, i'm convinced that if if the, the certain current attitudes continue in the muslim world we'll see more strident forms of secularization atheism deism i already see that happening in turkey certainly iran and in, in other parts of the muslim world so I think we need to rethink these issues for that end, not, not to betray uh, certain reality. Well, look, I think we've uh, reached the end of uh, today's discussion. And my apologies, I think I've taken up uh, both of your time uh, beyond uh, what I had promised. But uh, I think it, it's, it's been a really interesting discussion. And, um, you know, there's been a, 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 a lively but, uh, uh, but a, a very civil debate and discussion about uh, about the Muslim world. I, if I may, just one last question to you, Mustafa. I mean, we we number around a billion, billion and a half Muslims uh, today, and I would imagine, even with uh, the failings in the Muslim world, your authoritarian governments, the uh, the excesses that that exist in the Muslim world, by and large, probably, and I, I think I'm I'm right in saying this, probably most Muslims. Would, would probably incline towards a more traditionalist approach. Uh, and traditionalism is an umbrella that, that encompasses lots of, lots of views, of course, but more traditionalist approach to what, to that of, uh, to, to, different to what you are probably uh, um, uh, calling for here. Uh, how do you imagine these Muslims are going to change? Like what's your, what's, you know, you, you've, you put a very, a strident view that the Muslim Ummah and, and Islam needs to reform. How do you imagine that reform is going to take place? Where, in many ways, I suspect, and I think you you probably agree with this, you're uh, you're um, uh, going against the tide of uh, popular Muslim opinion, especially since uh, the war on terror. I don't have a ambition to change the opinions of the whole Ummah. Uh, I just have will to add something to the discussion, uh, discussions of the Ummah in the 21st century. And uh, I don't think we should all change. I think we will all change. But I think uh, just like issues of democracy or other things, I mean, there are issues that we have to face. And I'm trying to say something. And what I try to do is that uh, I also think, again, look, I mean, uh, it's generally not a bad, a good example, but look at the Jewish example of, I mean, there are Orthodox Jews, ultra-Orthodox Jews. There are some Reformed Jews. You know, they're all Jews of different kinds. And I think uh, that that is, uh, that's the kind of thing. I mean, we will have a spectrum of views as we always had. And I think the, the problem at certain times of our history that that spectrum was tilted by the state towards one end or the other. Some people were persecuted and others, and it changed from time to time. And I think that should not happen anymore. And, uh, and I think... And I think if we overcome some of the issues in our uh, tradition, which makes all the shocking headlines in the Western world once in a while, which sometimes come from Western biases and highlights, of course, but if you overcome these issues of religious freedom in, in our tradition, we have lots to say to the modern world. I mean, it never came up, but like this issue of racism. I mean, I'm amazed by the problem with racism and the obsession with race I see in America. And to me, like, this is bizarre. Like, I never thought of people's skin color as something important that, that defines them. Because I, I'm a Muslim. I, pe- for me, people are Muslim, Christian, or Jew, or maybe socialist and liberal or communist, that sort of thing. It, 
the idea that race is such an important identity, it defines them. I mean, I think we Muslims can heal this uh, racism and the obsession about the identity issues in those. We can say something about that. But first, we have to, I think, deal with some of our issues, which I see as not uh, actually core values of our faith tradition, but historical interpretations of that, just like slavery was, just like the lack of democracy and absolute monarchy was. Thank you for your time today, Mr. Baakyo and uh, Ovin Miranjum. It's, uh, it's really been a pleasure speaking to the two of you today. Thank you, Mohammed, and thank you, Obamir. I think uh, we, we've come to some agreement on some issues and some disagreement, but that's what uh, I think a healthy debate discussion should do. Uh, I certainly respect the intentions of Obamir and share his concerns. I'll just say that, you know, I don't think uh, only good Muslim is a non-Muslim, and I don't think the dictators in the Muslim world are nice people. I'm against that, and I think we're against them. Oh, good. Oh, good. Lovely, lovely, uh, Mustafa. And again, I, I always am challenged by uh, your uh, well-intentioned thinking. Um, whatever I pointed out as the elephants in the room and so on, they really were a, a way for me to uh, provoke, if you will, what I see as to draw your attention to some of the potential incoherence in your argument. Um, um, I think that I want to draw our attention, mine and, and yours, to the verse in the Quran, um, that you believe in part of the book and reject the part. Uh, and this is addressed both to the Jews and through the Jews to us. And I think that when uh, one calls for Muslims to become more like Christians or Jews, uh, one is going against a fairly heavy uh, artillery from the divine himself. Um, that, and that's why I think that we should be um, uh, more, if you will, more attentive to, to these issues. And that's what I've tried to do, to try to be more, uh, to, to take part, uh, all of it, but to take all of the revelation as well as human wisdom. Right. So I think that uh, your call to embrace the human wisdom, I 100% agree with. Look, thank you for your time today and uh, um, enjoy the rest of your day. I know it's early there in, in the States and uh, uh, it'll be great to, uh, to, to have uh, the two of you on again at some point. Okay, maybe, it, it, when you, maybe when you publish your next book, Mustafa. Okay, well, the next book has a chapter on the blessings of the Sharia and how it safeguarded law against dictators. Maybe that's something we can agree more with uh, Obama. Right?